I'm joined once again by my friend Don Luskin. He's the Chief Investment Officer at Trend Macroletics, joining me from Dallas, Texas. Don, great to see you again. How are you? Great to be here. There's a lot going on right now. We're like two weeks out uh, from the presidential election, less than that. Uh, and, you know, this one has a lot of implications. And so I like how in your publications you <laughs> uh, post a trigger warning uh, before your analysis. But this discussion really is not so much about politics as, as it is the mechanics of politics. And then what I'm interested in is what the investment ramifications uh, will be. So um, let's start with something uh, that I guess all of us sort of know and have observed before, but you break down statistically, is how the markets, uh, there is a correlation between uh, the health of the stock market or the perceived health of the stock market or markets in general Right. and how the incumbent does in an election. And I'm interested to, to look into this with you and, and see which is the cause and which is the effect, because it's, it's maybe not as simple as one might think. Uh, fair enough. So what you're talking about is the remarkable track record going back to uh, over 30 elections, all, all the way back to 1900, uh, where we check and see how the stock market did three months prior to election day and see if it underperformed or uh, outperformed the average performance for about 90 days. And it turns out that there is a nearly perfect track record with extremely few exceptions, like a 90% accurate track record, that when the stock market is up uh, above average performance uh, over the three months prior to election day, the incumbent individual running, if there is one, eh, like there is this year, wins. And even if there isn't an incumbent individual running, if the stock market is up, the incumbent party wins 90% of the time. And if the stock market's down, the incumbent individual loses or the incumbent party loses. Now, you're exactly right to ask which way, maybe both ways, uh, do the cause and effect lines run. Uh, and you know, one never knows. You know, anytime you look at two things that are correlated, very hard to know which one is causing the other or if there's some third unmeasured thing that's causing them both. But when it happens with this kind of accuracy for over a century, well, at least it's a thing and you almost don't have to understand which way the lines of causation run. So here we are, uh, we're recording this about a little less than three weeks away from the election and the stock market starting on October 3rd, that's three months before the November 3rd election day. It's in absolute terms up about four and a half percent and versus the average for the same number of days, it's up about 3%. So uh, our little indicator is saying that President Trump's gonna win. And I know we've got more than two weeks to go and the market could change direction and maybe it'll change its opinion. But right now it's predicting that Trump will win. So what I'd like to know or talk about is that uh, it sort of makes sense. So, you know, uh, stock market's doing well, maybe the economy is doing well, uh, maybe the government is doing a good job and uh, the stock market is up because the government is doing a good job. People like prosperity. They like to not rock the boat when things are going well. So that all makes sense. Uh, but what I'd like to talk to, about, talk to you about right now is um, people are quick to point out now that the stock market is not the economy. But I'm wondering if how long ago maybe it was uh, since the stock market was a good reflection of the economy. And if it w were a good reflection of the economy, then this statistic would make complete sense because both people who participate in the stock market and people who don't participate in the stock market would be feeling good. Uh, can you can you speak to that? Um, I, I assume you agree with me now that the stock market is not the economy, but perhaps at one time it was more reflective of the economy. Well, I'm not really sure I agree with any of that. Uh, I, I know that just as a definitional matter, the stock market isn't the economy. They're, they're, they're two different things. But the stock market certainly reflects the economy. And you couldn't go very long uh, with a bad economy and at the same time have a good stock market. Now, one of the reasons why it gets a little bit confusing is the stock market tends to look ahead. Now, it's not always right when it looks ahead, but it's definitely not looking backwards because people make investments based on what they expect. And even if those expectations get thwarted, it's nevertheless you know, our best shot at making predictions. So here we are right now with stocks, as we speak, maybe just two or 3% off of all-time highs, 
when we're still struggling to get out of what just a few months ago was just a downright depression you know, caused by the economic lockdowns in, in the wake of the, of the COVID pandemic. So you want to say the stock market isn't a reflection of the economy because stocks are all-time highs, but the economy isn't yet? Well, I think the stock market is a reflection of the economy. It's just reflection is a poor word. It's like a telescope that's peering into the future. It's not merely a mirror that reflects. That you know that that's so true, Don. But what if uh, the target that the telescope is fixated on is a balance sheet that is going from say seven trillion dollars maybe to ten trillion by the end of the year? That's at the Federal Reserve, and interest rates uh, that are going to be uh, nailed to zero effectively, as far as the telescope can see. What, what if that's what people are fixated on and not other factors that might uh, reflect a good economy? Well, those, uh, the, the reason that the Fed is going to do those things, you, know, you can argue whether it's going to work or not, you know, so far so good. The Fed's doing those things in order to create a better economy. You know, it believes that it can lubricate the financial system by having a large balance sheet. And I got to tell you, uh, they've done a pretty good job. It was less than six months ago that we were literally in a depression. And on the very day that the stock market bottomed on March 23rd, that was the day the Fed announced that it was going to do all the things that you're talking about. And that turned the stock market around. And so, you know, the stock market is looking at a Fed that is being an effective rescuer of the economy because what the Fed has done so far has been remarkably successful. Now, I'm not saying the Fed is responsible for every job that's been created since the bottom in April, but it is nevertheless the case that we lost 20 and a half million payrolls in just two months because of the COVID lockdowns. And we've since gained more than half of them back. We've gained about 11 and a half million back. And what was the turning point? The turning point was when the Fed started these policies. So you can't, you know, Mr. Market can't be that much of an idiot for being a little bit optimistic that these policies aren't going to be uh, discontinued too soon. Okay, uh, let's get to the part that I find very interesting. And, and that's the part uh, in these last few articles uh, that you've written, Don, where you sort of dissect the minutiae of uh, presidential uh, election mechanics, something that uh, we thought we'd never have to really know or, or understand. Uh, so, but here, here we are. And what you're uh, suggesting is that as a result of one party pushing uh, the use of mail-in ballots or the expansion of this method of voting, that this has some unintended consequences. Uh, so can you start out, obviously, the Democrats have a reason for wanting to do this, uh, but what's not talked about is what might end up happening as a result. So right. lead us into that. Okay. And so let's go back to the beginning. And I'm just going to repeat the, the trigger warning that you mentioned. We're going to be talking about politics. We're going to be naming presidential candidates. We're going to be naming parties. I'm not trying to get anybody to vote any particular way. I don't have any particular advocacy here. Just trying to help people understand what's going on and maybe make investment decisions. Now, it is the case that Democrats have been pushing the expanded use of mail-in ball balloting. And they probably aren't doing that if they don't think it's in their advantage. I suppose they might have some altruistic reason for doing it, but you know, these are politicians after all, and Republicans are the same way. So it is something that Democrats are promoting. What you say is true. However, you don't have to tell people this year to do a little bit more mail-in balloting uh, because people are, you know, if possible, you know, wanting to stay at home a little bit more and not go to public crowded places like, you know, basement of a church where balloting would normally take place in person. So even if the Democrats hadn't been pushing these initiatives, which they had anyway, we would have a surge of mail-in voting this year, the likes of which we've never seen before. And the problem with mail-in voting is twofold. It's actually three, but I'm not even going to mention three, except to say, just to name it, three is it is subject to fraud. Now, so is in-person voting. Mail-in voting is more, but I don't want to argue that. Let's just talk about the other two difficulties with mail-in voting. Number one, the U.S. Post Office has withered away thanks to email and social media. It is no, the Post Office just barely is in the first-class mail business anymore. It's just a package delivery arm for Amazon. That's why it exists. 
So we are going to get in the weeks and days before the November 3rd election, a surge of first class letters, the ballots being returned, going through a very narrow capacity nozzle at the U.S. Postal Service. And it's not the Postal Service's fault. They're just like any other factory that is tuned for perfectly sensible reasons to a particular level of demand. And this is going to be a one-week demand surge where you can't expect them just to build and spend trillions of dollars on all, all this infrastructure just to you know, be ready for a, a one-week demand surge. That's it's just asking too much of, of people and of budgets. So there's going to be a problem. And it could be that mail is going to get lost, that it's going to get delayed, that people are going to get very frustrated just by the physical process. If you even know where near your home, there's one of those old, you know, big metal red, white, and blue boxes that used to be on every street corner in America. I mean, I, I just moved here to Dallas a, a year ago. I, it was like three months before I finally found the one that's nearest to me. And it's like a mile away. And that's because people don't use them anymore. Nobody's trying to suppress the use of the U.S. mail. They're just not necessary anymore. They're just an eyesore and nobody uses it anymore, except now, except for the next three weeks. So what's going to happen if everybody in my neighborhood goes to that one little box, if they can even find it, and they all try to put their ballots in on the same day? That box is only so big. And what happens when it fills up? What happens to those ballots? Well, that's just one of a thousand problems you can imagine just with the physical processing. The other problem is that when you go to a polling place, it's different from district to district and state to state, but nowadays it's a pretty modern process where you are handed a piece of paper that has your name on it and you put it in a little reader and a little video screen comes up. It's like a little touch screen. And they hand, nowadays they hand you a little sanitary pencil that you can use to, to mark your ballot. That's a pretty error-free process. I'm not saying it isn't subject to hacking or fraud, that doesn't matter. It's an error-free process. Mail-in balloting is not error-free. You get this complicated thing. You have to be sure to sign it in the right place. There's no poll watcher there to help you if you can't figure it out. You have to figure out how to fold it and get it in the envelope. And some of them for security reasons, you have to like tear off a little tab and then you have to fold over this special flap and lick it a certain way. And, you know, God help you if you forget to put a stamp on it, right? So there are all kinds of reasons why typically in elections where there are, because there's always been mail-in balloting. It's just, it's just in the past, it's been called absentee balloting. There is a spoilage rate, a disqualification rate, anywhere in a range from about 5 to 18%. That's a lot of votes getting disqualified. And this time around, it's going to be people who've never done it before. And the people who do the qualifying and the disqualifying are going to have to deal with volumes like they've never handled before. So here, and with the exception of one state, I forget which it is, but every state has its own law on this. But 49 out of 50 states have a law saying that you can't open up the ballots and even start the qualification process, never mind counting. You can't even qualify them until the polls have closed on election day. So we know for sure that the results of this election aren't going to be known for days. It's not because it's so hard to count mail-in ballots. It's hard to qualify them. You have to check signatures. You have to see, ooh, this one messed up in this little way. Is that enough to disqualify it or is it not? So, you know, everything's a decision. So there'll be delays and delays and delays. And because there's so much mail-in uh, balloting and because that disqualification process is so subjective, there will be litigation. So what's going to happen is this is going to be like the 2000 election where there were those three counties in Florida where it wasn't even about mail-in balloting. It wasn't even about fraud. It was about, remember those butterfly ballots for Bush and Gore, where the complaint from the Gore team was that those butterfly ballots laid out in such a way that when you put your little pin through the hole to vote for Gore, your little stylus actually ended up in the place for Bush. And that was a legitimate complaint. The problem is once that mistake happened, how do you go back? and re-qualify those, try to figure out what the voters' intent was. Well, that's what all that litigation and three Supreme Court decisions was in the six weeks after Election Day in 2000. It took six weeks to work that out in just three counties in Florida. 
And while that was happening, the stock market fell 10%, by the way. The stock market does not like constitutional crises. The stock market does not like to have rulings on the field by the referee known as the Supreme Court. That means something's gone wrong when, when they have to make a ruling. So this time, it's going to happen not just in a few counties, in many counties, and in many states. And this will probably be a very close election. And, you know, think about all the courtroom dramas you've seen where the district attorney, the prosecutor says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is my intention to show you that this defendant here, whom we're trying for murder, had means, motive, and opportunity. Well, we know that politicians are full of means and motives. You know, these are clever people who want to win. They don't always have the opportunity. This time, they have the opportunity. And the opportunity is that all this mail-in balloting becomes a target for litigation where depending on which party you are, you strategically choose to litigate or not if you think it's in your advantage. All that has to happen is you have to have a state, like say Pennsylvania, say Wisconsin, Ohio, any of the swing states that made a difference in 2016 or to make a difference again this time. All you have to have is have the number of disqualified mail-in ballots be enough numerically to turn the tide if they all went one way or the other. You can litigate that or not, depending on how you want it to turn out. So if your candidate's ahead, well, you're not going to litigate that one. But wait, it's, there's actually a whole other level to it. There may be a circumstance in which the Republicans, and this is asymmetrical. I don't think the Democrats would ever want to do this. There may be a situation in which Republicans want to litigate the living daylights out of mail-in ballots in a state even where they think Trump is going to win. And the reason why is if they think Trump is losing in enough other swing states, then litigating, say, Pennsylvania, long enough so that that litigation extends past December 14th, which is the statutory deadline by which Pennsylvania and every other state has to say, okay, this is our slate of electors, duly elected, duly certified by the governor, we have to send them to the Electoral College in Washington on December 14th. And if one or two states in a close election don't send their electors, now what happens? Now, neither candidate gets a majority of 207 in the Electoral College that has 538 votes, and it takes 270 to win under the Constitution. And when nobody has a majority, the election is determined by the House of Representatives, not by the Electoral College, not by the people. Now, this isn't for sure, but it's 95% probable that the distribution of congressmen in the House of Representatives in the new Congress, the one that's going to be elected on November 3rd and will be seated in January, will be, even if a whole bunch more Democrats end up being congressmen, there will nevertheless be 26 out of 50 states that have a majority of Republican congressmen and only 24 out of 50 that have a majority of Democratic congressmen. And under the 12th Amendment, which governs this, the House picks the president, not by all 438 congressmen voting, and you just see you got more. You get 50 votes. Each state gets one vote. So South Dakota's vote is just as powerful as California's. And there are more red states than blue states. So, yeah, it's almost certain that the Democrats are going to pick up an even bigger majority than they already have in Nancy Pelosi's Democratic House of Representatives. But it's also the case that if this election goes to the House of Representatives, they will elect Trump. And Trump knows this. This is his path. And these people are not stupid. This is the path they're going to take, and they know how to take it. And the amazing sort of capstone on all this is fate gave us an amazing event a couple of weeks ago with the most unfortunate death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which opened a place on the Supreme Court. Now, until she gets replaced, which might happen as soon as Monday, there are only eight people on the Supreme Court. So if any of the things I've described, and I could go further, there are even crazier things that could happen that would cause a ruling by the Supreme Court. An eight-person Supreme Court could deadlock, in which case you don't get a decision. So that's like having referees on the field who can't agree. And so they, they just can't say, you know, was that a foul or not? Uh, was, was the guy off sides or wasn't he? Well, 
in this environment I'm describing, the American people are going to be craving certainty and legitimacy. And if the Supreme Court is tied four to four, then we don't even have that ref on the field. So it looks like we're going to have nine. Now, if something goes wrong and Amy Coney Bryant doesn't get confirmed by the Senate on Monday or ever, then all that has to happen is Mitch McConnell recesses the Senate and the Constitution allows Donald Trump to make a recess appointment. That will not be the first time in history that that's happened. Some very famous justices, including uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren, uh, that was a recess appointment. So we are going to have nine refs on the field. And because Trump's going to pick the ninth one, they're going to be friendly refs on the field. So that's the way this is going to play out. And so when you say, well, uh, fine, you're, you know, your, your little model says that when the stock market's up in the 90 days prior to the election, that means the incumbent's going to win. That means Trump's going to win. What, are stocks stupid? You know, can't they see the polls? Don't they know that Trump's going to lose? Uh, I just told you a really credible story for why Trump isn't going to lose. This is uh, credible, uh, academically credible, sort of incredible if you think about it. Uh, you brought up the sports analogy. How about Don Luskin watching game film from the 1700s going to the 12th Amendment to figure out uh, what the strategy might be? It's just incredible. And one point you didn't make uh, just now, but you did make in your articles, is that there's a difference between fraud and what you're calling hacking. Because mm -hmm. the hacking you're talking about is what? Doing everything you can within the rules, uh, being right. creative within right. the rules. And both sides do it. And that's exactly what you're talking about here, isn't it? It, it really is. I, I'm not making any forecast of anybody doing anything that isn't per absolutely perfectly legal. So what, what's going to happen, Don, if, uh, if we do, in fact, go this route? There are going to be months of uncertainty, possibly. That's right. What's going to happen to the markets during that time? Where would you want to be positioned? Uh, let's say what you're thinking is an absolute certainty. Where do I want to be uh, just for, for, the, for the end of the year here? Well, you know, markets are already kind of bracing for this, I think. If you look at the uh, forward curve of futures contracts on S&P 500 volatility, uh, they definitely have a bulge uh, right after the election. And they don't uh, come back to today's level of forecasted volatility uh, till like spring of next year. So uh, people are already hedging this. I think you probably want to be risk off. You, you, you want to be in safe haven assets while this is playing out. And one of the reasons, you know, you, I guess you could say, why bother? Because, you know, fine, it'll, this will be a you know, fascinating story that'll definitely go into the history books if it happens. But, oh, really, you know, should that hurt the economy? Should it hurt the stock market? Does anybody really care on which day exactly, which month exactly we know who the next president is? Well, I think this year of all years, it might matter more than usual. Uh, you know, again, we're, you know, we're having a very nice V-shaped recovery out of the COVID depression, but we're only halfway done with it. And, you know, we lost 20, you know, what was it, you know, 22 million jobs and we've only gained 11 back. So that means 11 to go. And if we get enough uncertainty in the kind of political environment that we're in right now, where, you know, this has been a year where people react to political events with, you know, urban violence, you know, there's rioting, there's looting. And, you know, I can certainly understand why there would be protests given some of the triggers that have happened here. I, I don't understand why there would be uh, looting and burning and cop killing, but, you know, that's happened too. So who's to say in an environment where that has already become the norm, that wouldn't happen again if political activists, which is like practically everybody nowadays, you know, gets the word that, you know, oh my God, this is, you know, the, you know, this is, you know, Trump, the dictator, you know, trying to uh, take over America. And, you know, Fox News would have exactly the opposite story about Biden. So who knows who's going to be rioting in the streets. If that happens, people are going to say, well, honey, uh, I guess they're burning downtown Minneapolis again. So maybe we shouldn't go downtown for dinner tonight. Maybe we should wait about three months. And a company is going to say, God, we were just going to hire 50 new people. You know, let's wait till next year. And that's what makes double dip recessions. When yeah. people just make the decision, one heart at a time, one mind at a time, one company at a time, to just pull back. 
So that could happen. And you might want to be ready for that. You might want to hedge a little bit about that. Why be greedy? Especially if you believe, as I do, that whatever you may think about the totality of the personalities of the two men running against each other for president, whatever you think of the totality of their policy mix, which includes economics, social stuff, environmental stuff, there's a lot of stuff that might make you vote one way or the other. And I respect it all. But in terms of sheer benefit to, say, stock market investors, there's no question in my mind that you would prefer Trump. For one thing, Biden is making no secret of the fact that he wants to double the tax rate on dividends and capital gains. So, and he's, he says he's gonna do it on day one. So if Biden wins, what's gonna happen the day after, you know, let's say in, in this completely contradicts everything I've said so far, but let's say we know the winner on November 3rd. That's not gonna happen. Uh, let's say we know him on November 10th or December 10th. Whenever we know the winner, if the winner is Biden, and it's still this calendar year, everybody is going to sell their appreciated stocks and take the capital gains hit at 20% instead of what 40%, which is what it'll be under Biden. Every company that's been sitting on cash is going to dividend out that cash at a 20% tax rate instead of the 40% tax rate that it'll be under Biden. Now, is that such a bad thing to dividend out all your, your corporate cash? Well, I don't know. If you like companies that are financially stable and have a lot of cash, that's a bad thing. So, this could be very destabilizing. It could trigger waves of selling. And you just might want to remember that as we go into this. Um, let's say we get a Trump victory. And uh, the reason for that, the reasoning would be we want you know, more of the same people who enjoyed uh, profits in the stock market as an example. But uh, the same policy is not going to necessarily get us the same gain in a second term, right? So those tax cuts happened once. Uh, the, the stock buybacks and, and so forth, those things happen once. It, if he continues the current policy, what can we expect to see? Well, what you can expect to see at a minimum is not having those things that happened once that helped when they happened to not see them run in reverse. So one of the, I think the most remarkable thing that Trump did was cut the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. So that was an instantaneous boost to S&P 500 earnings of 12%. And that makes stocks go up, doesn't it? Now, Biden says he's going to undo that on day one. Now, we've had earnings impaired uh, because of the dip in corporate, corporate earnings that we had during the COVID depression. So if Biden says what he wants, does what he says he wants to do with the corporate tax structure, S&P 500 earnings are going to fall 14% as soon as he signs that piece of paper. So for me, it's enough with Trump to just avoid that self-inflicted wound. So, okay, but if we have a Biden presidency, he's not just going to be sitting on his hands. So you're right, uh, there's probably going to be tax increases, but both parties spend money. And it seems like what investors, the good ones, what they do is they just figure out ahead of time where that money is going to go and then just wait for it which is why they hate uncertainty more than anything else. I think they'd rather have a Biden pres presidency than to be really uncertain about it. Well, uh, that's so for sure. Where's the money going to go in a Biden presidency? Is it fiscal spending, infrastructure, the typical kind of stuff you see? Well, if, if he can actually achieve that, that's what he's promising. But, you know, the, the, the problem is that is a shift of decision-making power from individuals and corporations to the government in terms of how capital is allocated. So, your, you know, your tax, your personal taxes are going to go up. Corporate taxes are going to go up. That money will be collected by the government and spent by the government on solar panels and windmills, and that'll be put up by union labor. And you know, the decision will be made that that's the right way to spend the money, as opposed to having 350 million people and thousands of companies decide how to spend their own hard-earned money. Now, if you think the Congress of the United States is going to be, is a better capital allocator than you or than me or all of our neighbors, or all of the companies we invest in and admire, then I think you should seek psychiatric help immediately. <laughs> okay, uh, we got to leave it there, Don. Where can people read more from you? Because this was just fascinating stuff. 
go to my website, trendmacro.com. All right, check that out. And then, Don, I hope I can have you back after the election to uh, break it down either way. Hey, well, if my forecast comes true, you'll have a whole three-month window to do that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank and then you. maybe uh, next time we'll solve the problem of your football team there in Dallas as well. That's a much harder problem. Oh, that's too hard. <laughs> All right. Take care, Don. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.